So when we think about what Shakespeare thinks about rich and poor and social status, quite interesting to start with his own life. Shakespeare's born to a modest family. We know his father's in quite a lot of trouble for debt. But Shakespeare himself goes to London. He really makes good. He makes a lot of money as a sharer in the Chamberlain's Men. Uh, gets a coat of arms for his father and for himself, so he becomes a gentleman. Master William Shakespeare, that's the name on the title page of the first folio, so he's a gentleman. Uh, he buys a big house, new place in Stratford-upon-Avon, so he's a local boy, goes back home, he's made, he's made very good. That's a story of social mobility, and interestingly that's a story we never get replicated in Shakespeare's plays. So although the expansion of London at the time uh, the expansion of London as a commercial centre is making a lot of people rich who weren't born to it and it's bringing a lot of people to a new, more socially mobile life. And even though other playwrights, like Christopher Marlowe, who's a big influence on Shakespeare, or Thomas Middleton with whom he collaborates, even though for them the upwardly mobile figure, the self-made man, is a really powerful dramatic uh, character, we, Shakespeare doesn't go there at all. In fact, I think Shakespeare is quite socially conservative. We could say Shakespeare's plays are quite socially conservative. Let's take Twelfth Night as an example. So at the heart of Twelfth Night is a woman who dresses as a man. Viola dresses as Cesario. And if we were to think about what the Elizabethan moralists say about social conduct, we would think that the, uh, the idea that a woman would usurp a man's authority, that that uh, gender would be transgressed in this way would be enormously socially threatening. But the play doesn't seem to feel that at all. Viola perhaps is the one character dressed as Cesario who gets what she wants in the play. She gets to marry Orsino at the end. She's rewarded effectively by the plot for what she has done. And where the play puts its disapproval is on a different character who wants to tr cross a boundary and that's the character of Malvolio. Malvolio is a steward, a sort of senior household manager to Olivia and partly through his own vanity and partly through a trick played by other people he comes to think that Olivia is in love with him and he has a wonderful fantasy of what he will do once he's married to Olivia and how his life will be changed, he'll be a man of leisure, he'll wear wonderful velvet clothes, he'll have a watch which is obviously a great gewgaw of the uh, early 17th century, a great uh, sort of luxury symbol. Uh, and, but this fantasy is immediately punctured, it's never going to happen. The play couldn't possibly allow a steward to marry uh, his mistress and Malvolio is punished very harshly in fact for this. He's really humiliated, he's brought to the brink of madness. Uh, the end of Twelfth Night is not really a comedy I think for Malvolio. So then, is Shakespeare really on the side of the rich or on the side of the poor? This has been a long question through Shakespeare criticism and in fact uh, really, those people who are themselves on the side of the rich have tended to think that Shakespeare is too, and those people who are on the side of the poor have wanted Shakespeare to be a champion for them. That's the case in Shakespeare studies of, on all kinds of issues. But there is a play where Shakespeare puts this question absolutely at the heart of the play, and as is usual, I think, in Shakespeare, he's asking the question, he's not answering it. Uh, that's the play Coriolanus. Uh, in Coriolanus, the conflict is between the patrician, the ruling class in Rome, and the plebeians, the people. And Coriolanus is a patrician who needs the plebeian vote in order to take up political office in Rome. But he despises the plebeians. He can hardly bring himself to speak to them, to ask for them, uh, to support him uh, in his political ambitions. He doesn't really believe that they ought to be involved in the, in the political life of the city at all. And uh, it's, but it's very interesting to think uh, about where Shakespeare's sympathies lie on this. Uh, is Coriolanus's disdain for the people something which uh, the audience themselves share or is it part of the way in which he's characterised negatively? Uh, it's a way that the, uh, the play can be performed in quite different ways to bring out quite different aspects of Coriolanus's character. He can be uh, a hero, he can be a villain. Uh, the 20th century stage history shows that it can be either way. So even in the play where Shakespeare puts rich and poor uh, on a collision course, I don't think he comes out on one side or another. 